Open Journal, good evening and welcome to today's charting session. So today, Open Journal is going to make history. That's right, charting session history by nice. doing the first ever charting session that will finish on time. Okay. <laughs> nice. We'll try to cover everything before 9 p.m. And uh, we'll try to make this sweet and simple, but right on the spot. So with that, let's begin with the Philippine market. So I'll take you through the Philippine market. And if I'm going to take you through Philippine market, there is not much change, especially if you were in our town hall meeting. So Matt, just a check. Can you see the Philippine monthly chart over here? Yep. All right. So looking at the Philippine chart, nothing has changed. For those of you who were at the last town hall, the biggest development was that instead of a 6,000 level, which we were seeing, remember, why did we have 6,000? 6,000 is simply a confluence between three technical techniques. First, you have the DCS channel over here. Oh, so you have, it's the support of the DCS channel. Let's put that there. So you see the 6,000 somewhere here. Not only that, it's a confluence with the 382 Fibonacci retracement, which if you see here, from all the way to when the secular bull market started, secular bull market, which in technical terms, in CMT terms, that's the 15 to 25 year time frame. And ever since 2010, 11, at least COL or my team, COL, the team that I was a part of, identified, was one of the first teams that identified secular trend in place, primarily because of OFW, BPO, demographic dividend, and investments as a percentage to GDP. At least that's what I believed at the time. Over time, I eventually realized, at least from a fundamental macro point, of view, those were not the primary drivers, but really the liquidity that all central banks were pumping from around the world. And with that liquidity subsiding, we now have a secular trend that is reversing. So we have a going back a confluence to the 382. Not only that, it is also right at the fourth wave of one lesser degree. Now, some of you may be new to that. In Elliott terms, typically when you have a correction, in a certain degree, in this case, a secular degree, 15 to 25 year cycle degree, you typically have a correction or at least an ABC will end at the fourth wave of the extended third. That's not definite. That's just from a major probabilistic point of view. So with those three confluences, those were the three ingredients behind the I Love You 6000 call that we had middle of 2019 last year, but wait, what's happening right now? If we take a look at the unfolding classical technical analysis pattern, you will see that we have what we call a multiple or a complex head and shoulders pattern. Now, for most of you who were at the 2019 Investor Summit, there was a guy there who spoke the right hand of the top fundamentalist in the country, Wilson C., who said that the only book that Wilson C. recommends all his analysts, all his traders to read from end to end and note to heart is Edwards and McGee, Technical Analysis of Stock Trends. Now, if you... There is a copy when it comes to ebooks, so I will upload it to Google Drive so everyone can have a copy. Nice. Awesome. Okay. Anyways, going back. That book shows you a multiple complex head and shoulders pattern, which I believe what we have here. Remember, head and shoulders patterns are reversal patterns that reverse the overall trend. You see declining volume, which we see here. This is where we had peak volume. Not only that, you also have declining momentum divergence. You have here your peak RSI, which sets up your 
not just your first divergence, but your second divergence, which according to the book, John Hayden, Complete Guide to RSI, you need, quote-unquote, multiple long-term divergences before a reversal can be in place. And that's what we have here right now, multiple long-term divergences. Not just that, you also have your RSI over here. Now, this is a technique that, to put credit where it's due, I learned from Gio Asibal, George Asibal, also known as Z-Freaks. He uses a lot of these horizontal um, key levels for RSI. And you see here RSI is a leading indicator. You see here break already before even the pattern breaks down. So that was already a leading indicator for a breakdown. And uh, not only that, if you take a look at your MACD, your MACD will show you not only the divergences, but will also show you that the MACD or the signal line are already in below, or the MACD line and the signal line is already below the zero line, which in technical terms, at least from I learned from Juan is, that means that your month from a monthly long-term point of view, the Philippines is already in a downtrend. That is what it means when both your MACD and signal line are below the zero line. Now, moving back to the pattern, what do we have here? A pattern, typically, when you have a head and shoulders, if you want to measure the minimum, and the keyword is minimum, breakdown target, all you need to do is measure it from the head all the way to the shoulder, Take that, take the size of that, put it below here, and what you will have is a price suggestion of a long-term target of 4,691. That's, guys, that is a minimum breakdown target. And just to qualify, that is a minimum breakdown target. So to me, what if I'm going to weigh into that new piece of evidence, along with everything that we've been tracking for the past few months, obviously no one knows what's going to happen. OGK, what I think is maybe unfolding. So we have a breakdown over here if I'm going to zoom in on the weekly chart. So we have a breakdown over here. After a breakdown, typically you have a retest of that breakdown point call it an E3 of a downtrend reversal pattern after a retest, then you have the follow-through lower. I imagine that after this follow-through lower, you're going to have some strong support at the 6,000 level because of those confluences. And not just that, you have a strong bounce here, and then you, you might have a bounce over here. And then I think what's going to happen over the long term is that we are possibly mentally preparing for what we've trained everyone and what is called an E1 failure. What is an E1 failure? An E1 failure is essentially your first sign and signal between profit taking and distribution. What it means is if your E1 fails, meaning if when we have a bounce here and then you have prices bouncing and then finally rolling over and breaking that 6,000 level, then that is a sign of much, much lower levels ahead, possibly 4,691, possibly even much lower. So with that in mind, uh, um, so that's essentially where the Philippines is. And as we move forward along the price discovery process, not just for the Philippines, but for other global markets, things seem to be coming together. Why? Because if you look at the Philippines here, because people are saying, why are we even going to go down? Philippines is... We just printed a 2.3%. I think it was a 2.3% inflation today. Growth is still robust. We have um, a BSP who's willing to stay accommodative. The growth story is still intact. Well, I don't know about you, but those factors have been present 
whether you come to me and tell me that, hey, you know, the Philippine growth story is still there, OFW remittances are still driving a 70%, 80% consumption story, BPOs are still there, um, you have a demographic dividend where a higher product, where a higher percentage of the population enters the productive percentage of the population or that becomes, or you have a bigger percentage of the population that becomes or that enters the productive workforce, thereby increasing um, tax receipts, increasing spending, so on and so forth. Guys, these are exactly the same. It's exactly the same narrative that we were talking about in 2011, 2012, which tells me that the question you should be asking is whether the growth story is not intact or not, or whether the Philippines has good fundamentals or not. If this is exactly the same narrative that's been present since 2011, 2012, ito yung story na sa lahat ng mga mutual funds and new ITFs. If that's the same narrative, then the question you should be asking is how much of that narrative has been priced in already? How much of that narrative has been baked into the cake already? And if you're telling me that you're still holding or you're still buying because of the Philippine growth story, then nahuli ka na sa pansitan because that is exactly the same reason why people have been buying since 2011, 2012, 2013. What has changed is the number one driver. Bigger than the OFW, bigger than the BPO, bigger than the demographic dividend, bigger than investments as a percentage of GDP, which back then was 17, 18% of GDP, which is now close to around um, low 20s. The biggest driver has really been liquidity or quantitatively East dollars. And, as you, and that is no truer to any other emerging market in the Philippines right? because the Philippines. Good evening. Good evening. So, and that is no truer to any other emerging market than the Philippines. Why? Because the Philippines is 50-50, local and foreign money. It's the only market in emerging markets. It's the market in emerging markets that has the biggest percentage of foreign money or hot money participation. That's 50%. That's compared to what? 20-30% average for Asia, Southeast Asia. So with that, obviously, all of those macro and fundamental things you can simply set aside and just listen to what price is telling you. And what price is telling us is that growth story ain't intact. <laughs> and um, and um, as I was saying earlier, as we move forward towards the price discovery process, it becomes much, much clearer what the catalyst will be for the drop in the Philippines. And with that, I want to turn you to the U.S., which seems to be the catalyst. Matt, just a quick check. Can you see the chart of the S&P 500? Yep. Right. So just to take you through the bigger picture, so this is the S&P 500. That is the low since the 2009 crisis. And since then, it's made a nice DCS over here. And um, pardon all the studies, but... If you look very closely, you'll see the oscillator extreme over here, which without even looking at the top, whoop, you'll know that it's a three of a three, and then you have a five of a three, and then you have some correction here, which is a four, and then you have your second divergence, which is your warning sign. Not only that, if I take a look at the MACD, you have your MACD very close to crossing crossing down and why is a cross down very important every if you guys see these horizontal bars these horizontal bars over here every time you have a horizontal bar move from top to bottom or bottom to top that's typically when you have your expansion candle that's typically when you have your your e2 or your breakout those long expansion candles what we call expansion breakouts and um, from a monthly chart, that's pretty much, uh, you have your long-term divergence in place. Not only that, if we take a look at the weekly chart, you have also a divergence in place, not just here and here. You have these diver this divergence in place. 
And on the daily chart, you also have this divergence in place. You have a high, higher high, and then a high, lower high. And moving back to what we believe the catalyst will be for a further weakness in the Philippine markets. If I take you through the one hour chart of the S&P 500, so I have here some Fibonacci studies, and it seems to me that we are in the middle of a counter trend rally. What it means is we have a very clear five wave structure here. So, and for me, it's very clear you have a one, two, and then you have a three. Just looking with all the gaps, you have a breakaway gap, runaway gap, and then you have an exhaustion gap over here. So you have a one, two, three, and then a four, five. So that to me is very clear. Um, not just that, we have a very strong counter rally. And um, if you want evidences of a counter rally, counter rallies are often characterized with saw, overlapping choppy structure, which is what we've seen the past few days. And um, rallies that essentially make people believe that the bull market is back, which I believe is... Um, what I think some of the headlines have said after the 4% rally in the U.S. market yesterday. And if you look over here, if you guys are already familiar with the system, and I know most of you guys already are, you guys know over here that this black Fibonacci over here is meant to measure the fib retracement of what seems to be unfolding as a zigzag. So a zigzag, which means we have an A over here, a over here, we have a B. You have an A, which typically travels to the 236, 382. In this case, you had a little stretch to the, uh, to the 3 1, to the 50% Fib. And um, I believe this was the day that the Fed made the surprise 50 basis point, 50 basis point cut announcement ahead of their um, Federal Reserve meeting. Not only that, you have a pullback over here. And as soon as we have that pullback, then what we do is we create the DCS that bounds those parts, that typically bounds is that typically contains a zigzag. And not just that. Um, so I have here my resistance box over here, which I think can be a good stopping point for the zigzag, which means that we could have prices hit the 618 or possibly even the 786, which is within that resistance of that corrective pattern. Not only that, you have here a red Fibonacci over here. Now, some of you may be asking, what is this red Fibonacci but undamming Fibonacci? Well, the red Fibonacci is simply a Fib extension. So what the Fib extension simply does is that it helps me measure the C wave in relation to the A. So I've, I've, I drew a Fib extension from here to here and put it at the bottom of the C. Remember, C's in relation to A, historically, or at least probability of the time, majority probability, have a one-to-one -one relationship. That tells me that your C wave can travel all the way until here to the 3,254 before possibly rolling over, or the minimum, which is 618. That's the minimum relationship between a C and an A. And that is at the 3,148. So these are essentially the levels that I'm looking at for at least prices to stop. If it stops here, then we have a channel. If it stops at the 618, then we have some sort of a rising wedge, right? And um, the reason why I bring this up, because this pretty much lines up with our view on the Philippine index, whereby we see prices rallying back to the breakdown point maybe with, between the 7,000, 7,100. Even with the action today, after the 4% up move in the U.S. last night, you'd think that we'd be able to get above 7,000 today, but that was not the case. So we might have one of those um, um, E3s that don't really go back to the breakdown point, but rather you have a high pause or you have a very low pause before the breakdown point, before the follow-through lower. That could be a possibility also for the Philippines, given the relative weakness of the Philippines. But going back to the U.S. market, the reason why I'm, I've been tracking this very closely is because 
if you guys have attended the town hall last Saturday, if we're going to rank it from opportunity to opportunity, tier one opportunity obviously is the Bitcoin. We're pretty much guiding everyone there. That seems to be an opportunity that, that's panning out um, perfectly, at least for us. So we'll go to that later and some altcoins. But the second emerging opportunity, at least for traders, is at least this short over here. And this is why I want to bring the U.S. market up because this every time you have a leg down over here and every time you have a succeeding rally back up, whether this is an A, B, C, or whether this is a one, two, three down, then there you have a runway for a possible short for either a C down or a three down. If you ask me, what is the more likely possibility? Is this an A, B, C, or is this a one, two, three down? OGK, guys. I mean, even if I look at the Elliott World, Elliott Wave International, things that it's already a three down. You have Todd Gordon, who believe that it's only an ABC down of a larger fourth wave triangle simply because of wave equality dimensions. So it's pretty much even split inside the Elliott World, at least the triple black belts that we track. But the point that I want to make is, is that whether it's a three or a C on the way down, that is simply one of the questions that you have to live with, that you have to live with not being answered. How do we answer that? Simple. By the size of the succeeding down move. Most of you guys already know that if the down move exceeds one is to one or exceeds 1.61, the 1.618 times FIB extension, then the probability already swings towards the scenario that the leg down is already a third wave down and not a C wave down. Why? Because C waves typically move between the 0.618, the 1, and the 1.618 FIB extension, while third waves reach the 1.618 extension, even exceed that. If you go to our FIB framework, you'll see the probabilities 1.618, 2, 2.618, 3.618, and even the 4.236. So that's a short that I'm actually looking and stalking right now. And uh, while I have my eToro, my PDAX already in crypto, so I have my interactive brokers account, which um, while I do have some Bitcoin there, I am looking also to use that to possibly initiate a short for the U.S. market over the next few days. So that's something I'm looking at. Um, I hope that's been clear. And with that move down, whether it's a C down or a third wave down, that pretty much sets up your move down to 6,000 for the Philippine market. Whether it's a move down to 6,000 or whether it's a move to, um, yeah, that pretty much sets up the move down. That's your catalyst right there. And um, while I could be wrong, that seems to be the likely probability for now.